So we heard this morning from, from Etsy and from Heroku and from Her Majesty's government and they're all talking about how important it is to invest huge amounts of effort into making the perfect culture for your engineers to be productive and, you know, and having teams that just work on tools for other teams and all of that kind of stuff, which is fantastic. But um, I'm, from, I'm, I'm from a very early stage startup. We don't really have the resources to send our engineers off on a month long dev boot camp and then give them anything and everything they could possibly dream of, although, of course, we, we do try to. Um, so I'm here to talk about the same kind of thing, sort of um, developer productivity and getting that cu culture right, but from the point of view of an early-stage startup. And early-stage startup engineering, it's, it's sort of fundamentally different in that productivity is super important, but the the, really, the only thing that matters is that you're running experiments, that you're building things, you're trying things out, and you're getting closer to figuring out what your product should be. And so if you spend six months on the p most perfect sort of test-driven development, beautiful obelisk to um, software architecture purity, and then discover that you built the wrong product, that's a really bad position to be in. Now, it's not to say that it's not important to think about your tools and your processes and invest effort into, into productivity, but you've got to get the balance right. So this talk is about cheap tricks for startups. The question I'm answering is, what are the quickest tools to build that provide the most value? Where can you get the most bang for your buck in investing um, effort in your own tools and your development processes. And this is based on basically looking back at all of the stuff we've done with our company and saying what were the things where we did a little bit of work and it's just kept on paying us back and we've kept on getting value out of that. So I'm going to share some, share some of those, those cheap tricks with you, with you now. So I mentioned the importance of experimenting, being able to try things out quickly. And, um, and driving down the cost of that, making that easy to do is, 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 is super important. The single, so the single biggest, um, biggest payback we've had from development work we've done is just one feature we built quite early on, and that's the ability to have feature flags in our code base. So if you haven't heard of feature flags, they're a pretty common technique these days. Basically, they're a way of saying, this chunk of functionality here is only available to a subset of our users. Maybe it's only available to this one person. Maybe it's only available to our alpha testers or our beta testers. And having, so having a simple mechanism that makes it easy to switch entire sections of functionality on and off for different groups, is it allows you to do a B testing style stuff, it allows you to roll features out to beta testers, it allows you to have stuff in development without it getting in the way of your mainline production. It's a really useful capability. And I've only got three slides with code in, but I thought this was a good way to illustrate it. We have a very basic feature flag system. We have feature flags which are defined in a config file, and they have names like new maps and a little description that is shown to us in an interface somewhere. So our new maps feature flag means that the user gets map box, funky custom map box maps instead of old-fashioned Google JavaScript maps. Um, that kind of thing. So we, we set those up in a configuration file, and we've got a couple of code level utility functions that make it really easy for us to change site functionality based on those. So we, we use Python and Django. If you don't speak Python, I apologize. But this is saying, here's a function which, here's, here's one of our view functions, something you can do over the web. Um, and login is required, so if you're not logged in, you can't get to it. And there's a feature flag required of topic tracking. So if you're a user with topic tracking, you can do this thing. And if you're a user without, if, if you haven't got that ability, then you shouldn't have got here in the first place and you'll get an error message. Um, we also have a way within code of making a decision saying, if the user has the flag topic enhancements, do this stuff. If they don't, do this other stuff. And the last place we implement our feature flags is in our templates. Um, we use the Django templating language. We have a couple of custom template tags. We can say flag topic tracking, so anything within that block if the user has the ability to use the topic track tracking feature, show them this stuff. If they don't, don't show them that. And we have another one um, which we built after some of our beta testers got excited about unfinished functionality and started leaking it on Twitter, um, where we can say, if the topic tracking flag is active, so if you can see this thing, but, not, but the rest of the world can't, we can show you a little message saying, hey, this is for beta testers only. So all of this, this mechanism took a few hours one afternoon to put most of it together, and we've tweaked it a tiny bit since then. But it's basically completely, cha it completely changed the way we approached developing new features. It meant we could be way more, um, way more experimental, we could be much bolder, we could try out a sort of huge new feature, we could just stub it out to the point where it was usable by one of us if we knew what we were doing, put it live on, put it live on the site so only we could see it and, and continue to iterate on it, maybe give access to somebody who'd asked for it, all of that kind of stuff. So a very, very 
powerful feature with very little code needed um, to get it running. Um, to clarify slightly, a feature flag in, in our system, you can apply it to individual users. So I can say that person, that person, that person are allowed this feature. Or you can apply them to user tags, which we set up as an internal concept. So we have um, users who are tagged with al the alpha tag, beta tag, lanyard team tag, that kind of thing. So we can say, OK, anyone in the alpha group gets access to this feature. Um, and this worked fantastically well for quite a while until we got to um, until we sort of hit the limits of the feature flag system when we were doing a new way of logging into the site. Originally, um, users of Lanyard could only sign in using Twitter, and that worked fine up to a point, but we eventually knew we, knew we were going to have to go beyond that. So a couple of months ago, we launched the ability to sign into our site with Twitter or with LinkedIn or with a username and password. And the problem with that is that if you're trying to use feature flags for that, but you're dealing with people who haven't signed into the site yet, you haven't got a user, so you haven't got anything to attach the feature flags to. So we, um, our engineers came up with a, quite a neat workaround for this. We created a preview tag. Um, so it was a user tag. It could have feature flags applied to it. And we set it up so that if you visit preview.lanyard.com, even if you're not logged in, we treat you as if you're somebody inside of that tag. Preview.lanyard.com isn't available to general users. You know, it's, it's protected by HTTP access and all of that kind of stuff. But it meant that we could then, um, we could then turn on non-user related features in a controlled way using the same mechanism we already had. So the other reason that we love feature flags is that they help us keep the trunk version of Lanyard in a deployable state. One of our policies is that you should always be able to deploy trunk. And if you're doing, you can do work in branches or whatever you want, but we encourage people to merge into trunk as much as possible. And the only reason we can do that is that it's very easy for us to take unfinished functionality stick it by, and stick it behind a feature flag so we know it's not going to impact the, the mainstream users. So again, very small amount of development effort, huge amount of value in terms of the flexibility it gives us with developing the site and trying out new things. So the next thing that we've found we've got huge value out of is the effort that we invested in deployment. Now this, was a, this is a fair bit more effort than just the sort of 80 lines of Python that set up our feature flag system. But the value you get from having your deployment system working really smoothly is enormous. And it ties into this desire to roll out new things quickly, to try things out, and to be able to sort of make bold changes without worrying about um, being unable to, to fix things if something goes wrong. The first rule of deployment is there should be one command that deploys the site. And we've taken that a step further. We have one command, our, our deploy command, which not only deploys the site, but it can take a brand new server or a brand new virtual machine. It can install all of the packages that we need for our software to run. It can get our software on there. It can pack it, minify our JavaScript and CSS, stick those in the right place. It can restart up the web servers, restart the web servers, read load balance, all of these different steps. But it's all wrapped up in a single command. And the, the command we use can actually be targeted. So this top line here says, take the live environment and deploy the site to it. And if the live environment's one server, five servers, 10 servers, it's going, to, it's going to have the same effect. The second variant says, take the staging environment and use the target of um, a, a specific branch from Git, so our feature slash LinkedIn branch. You could also pass in a Git tag or a commit hash, or whatever you like, and deploy that. And because we've got this all wrapped up in a single command, it means that all sorts of other stuff is really easy to do. So we have, we have this plugged into our Jenkins continuous integration server, which means there's a button that you can click which deploys the website. Um, and we also have very cheap deployment logging. Um, uh, Etsy earlier on showed the, their deployinator thing, which is this wonderful piece of software that handles logging, of, lo logging deploys and gives you all of this information and stuff. But again, they've, they've got the and they, 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 they have the luxury of an engineering team who can be put, be put to build that sort of system. We took the much cheaper approach, and we, have it, we hooked into our campfire chat room using the campfire API, and every time someone deploys the site, the lanyard says, starting deploy, and it says, deploy succeeds. And so, the, um, so, the te so not only can the team see whenever a deploy's gone out, but we've actually, we can use the campfire search function to find how many deploys went out on different days and, and get all of that information. And again, that was a couple of lines of Python. And it, was, it was essentially free. So deployment needs to be easy. There needs to be one command that anyone can run that'll deploy the site. It needs to be fast. Um, and we 
but we do invest quite a bit of effort into speeding up our deploys. And it needs to be cheap. And by that, I mean cheap in terms of deployment, At one po uh, ch cheap in terms of performance. At one point, um, our deploys were causing quite a noticeable effect on the performance of the site. You know, end users were getting much slower page loads in the, in the time that the deploys went out, which meant that our engineers didn't really want to deploy as often, so they were bundling too many changes together. And, and um, so once we invested effort in, in making the performance hit go away, we were again back to pushing out features much faster, pushing out experiments. It's important that, um, that people can feel free to deploy at any time. And a related uh, policy we have, and this is fantastic for onboarding new engineers if you don't have the luxury of sending them off to boot camp for four weeks, is that at, at Lanyard, everyone deploys on their first day, which means that when a new engineer arrives, by the end of that day, we've got to have them set up with a development environment with all of the access um, to different repositories and things they need with checkouts, and they have to be able to take all of that and make a change and hit deploy and, and, and send the site out, which means that when they come in on their second day, they're ready to actually get real work done. So combine, I'm going to combine the two previous concepts, this idea of feature flags and the idea of, of being able to do, of, of making deployment easy. This is another thing which was a few lines of code and has given us an enormous amount of value, and that's having a read-only mode for our site. So Lanyard is a directory of conferences and events, and it works a little bit like Wikipedia, in that somebody can come in and they can add a conference, and then someone else can come along and say, okay, well, here are the speakers, somebody else can add the schedule, and so forth. And so from, from, from day one, we knew that um, we knew that this was going to be something which had a lot of rights going on, but if, if but the site would still be useful if nobody was making changes and it was just it, that people could just access the information. So what read-only mode lets you do is essentially flip your site into a mode where nobody can make any changes to it, but people can view it. And it gives you a huge amount of scope for doing um, complex maintenance operations behind the scenes. Um, as a sort of quite, as, so the best example I have of that is a few months ago, we, um, we did a huge infrastructure change. We had the site running on MySQL on Amazon EC2, and we decided we were going to move it over to running on Postgres, an entirely different data, relational database, running on physical hardware that we were releasing from software. And the, um, after, after a bit of debate, we decided that we may as well get both of these things done at once, because that would reduce our maintenance window to the smallest it needed to be. We actually managed to pull it, pull it off with no downtime to the site at all, because we had this ability to switch the site into read-only mode. So the way that works is, and read-only mode, it's, again, it's just one of these feature flags. Um, You've got the site up and running on the existing hosting. You flip it into read-only mode, at which point uh, nobody can sign in, and anyone who is signed, and, and, and nobody can make any uh, HTTP, HTTP post requests, so they can't change any of that data. Then you can take a copy of the database, leaving the old one up. You can migrate that into, you, in our case, we transformed it into Postgres. You can load it up on a completely new infrastructure stack. When you're, you can test that new, new stack and make sure that everything's working fine, and then once you're ready to go, you switch the DNS over to point at the new stack, you set up a proxy on the old site so that traffic there goes through to the new site, and you're up and running on a, new, on a completely new set of infrastructure without a single second when the, inf when the content of the site wasn't available to, to end users. And again, it works incredibly well really simple to implement. If you've already got feature flags, it's just a case of having a flag which puts a big warning banner on, the, on, on different pages of the website and disables the ability for people to sign in with a cookie. Um, last set of cheap tricks are around analytics. Um, something I've discovered with regards to analytics is that every startup I speak to has deep set analytics guilt. They're convinced that they're not looking into their data nearly enough and there's all of this, this fantastic information that they could be getting out of it. And the good news is that every startup has this. Um, but it turns out there are some very cheap tricks that you can do to get a much better idea of what's going on with your site and, and how people are using it. And you can dive as deep as you like with this. You know, you can have Hadoop clusters and you can hook into dozens and dozens of mechanisms for doing analytics and user tracking and co cohort analysis and all of that. But the cheap tricks are, are the ones which, which only, only take a few minutes and, and give, you, give you the most value. That's good, because you only have a few minutes. <laughs> I've got five minutes, I believe. Go for it. Okay. Um, 
So the cheapest trick we have is um, a very simple thing we call the history table. And again, this comes from the nature of our site being essentially a wiki. So we knew from the start that we'd, we wanted to be able to keep track of the changes that people were making. So if somebody came in and vandalized anything, we'd be able to see what they'd done. We'd be able to roll back. You can spend a lot of time building a very elaborate sort of version revision controlled thing for this or you can take the, 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 the easy option which is having a database table somewhere called the history table and every time somebody makes a change to the site you say this user made a change to this thing be it a conference or a session or a venue or call for puzzles whatever it is and the changes they made were this and we actually just dump the changes in as a, a dumb JSON format in a, in a column, because it's not something we need to query against, it's just something we need to be able to, to access, le um, access later on. We did, I, I originally thought, ooh, we could do that with MongoDB, because it's JSON and that's trendy, but I'm very glad we, we, we stuck it in the database and it turns out Postgres, a few million rows, it doesn't, doesn't even blink, it's fine. So the history table, Originally, we did this so that we could have tracking of, the, of, of how people were using the wiki-style nature of the site, but we quickly realized that it's an incredibly powerful tool for analytics as well. Each of these change has, changes has a change type, so that's an added staff operation, that's an edited session operation. Because they've got users and they've got types and they've got timestamps, it's trivial later on to come along and say, okay, well, how many people have ever edited staff, or how many edits did we get on a particular, de on, on a particular day, particular week, particular date range? And the actual code for, code for doing this, you know, it's, it's a single database table. All of our changes go through a services layer, which makes sure that we're writing the right things into. It's a very small amount of work for a huge amount of added value in terms of understanding how people are using the site. What this also gives us is essentially the ability to sort of run tail against our website and get a feel in real time for how people are using the service. Any sysadmin know, um, will tell you that the best way to understand a system that's in production is to tail a log file somewhere. Having a history table means that you can tail your, the, the application logic of your site and understand exactly what's going on. So while this makes a whole load of sense for a sort of wiki style site, we've actually started throwing all kinds of other actions into this table which aren't necessarily edits to something, but are still things that it's useful to keep an eye on and, and run analytics again later, against later on. So on top of all of this, you can build very basic internal metrics. And the most basic thing you can do to get metrics out of a, a database-driven website is to make sure you've got a created at field on every single table in the database. And it can often be tempting to leave that field off if you think, well, we will never really need to query that. Just, just, add, the, just add, the, add the column, because it, even if you didn't think you needed it originally, it means that you can always build, you, you get the ability to build graphs of your site growth in any aspect really, really easily. You can just say, okay, we've got a time, we've got a time stamp, so I can find out how many columns were added in an hour, in a day, in a month. I can, gra I can plot those on a graph. And on top of that, we can build a very simple reporting system. And again, you can go as deep as you like with this, but the most basic level of reporting that works for us is we have a bunch of Python functions, each one defining a named metric. So we have number of active users today, or number of Foursquare check-ins, or number of events added. Once, um, every, every morning at 3 a.m., a cron job fires, calculates all of those things, sticks them in the database table. That means that we can then draw graphs against them. We can export them into a spreadsheet. We can do all manner of analysis on these very simple, t this very simple time series data, um, despite having, having, you know, there's, there's almost nothing to the mechanism behind gathering it. And so here's a couple of graphs. You know, we're a startup, so we chop the axes off everything. Um, but there's our, there's, this, is, um, this shows the Foursquare feature that we launched a little while ago, where people could tie Lanyard into their Foursquare app, and then when they checked in um, at a venue that was hosting an event, we could send event information to them. And what this graph lets us see, we've got the, um, there's the exciting hockey stick at the top, which is actually much less useful than the less exciting how many things happened per day graph. But we, from this graph, we could see the point when Foursquare added us to their featured apps directory, and we went from a sort of trickle of people trying it out to thousands of people a day going, oh, what's this thing, and, and turning it on. So that's my collection of, of cheap tricks for startups. Again, these are things which should not take very much time at all to implement, but from our experience, give an enormous amount of value back in terms of the insight you get into how your, how, how your system's working, and in terms of developer productivity for, for making changes and 
and and and iterating on um, iterating on your product. So that's just you know, it's feature flags, it's read-only mode, a history table, and the simple mechanism for calculating reports every day. And I think those are the, the sort of very de definition of, of low-hanging fruit for startup engineering. So thank you very much. <laughs>